as final speaker for today, uh, I'd just like to, to thank uh, previous speakers for what's been a really excellent day. Uh, I've certainly enjoyed it very much, and I'm sure everybody else has. Uh, what has become clear throughout the days, I guess, was everybody knew already, is that for mammals in particular, but for a lot of the higher aquatic organisms, people are already getting a feel for population trends and pressures and uh, how to deal with them and how to uh, conserve the species. Uh, for a lot of aquatic invertebrates, people are still very much in the, the dark. We're beginning to get a feel for how common or how rare they are and where they live and what their trends are, but by and large they don't. Uh, dragonflies are the one exception. They're the uh, one group of aquatic uh, invertebrates. They, they spend about 90% of their time underwater as the, the nymph stage, so they are <laughs> genuine aquatic in, uh, insects. They're the one group that we certainly have a detailed knowledge at, at a, well, if not quite a global level as yet, but certainly a national level. Uh, it's been about 30 years since that's been the case. So I think the time is right to sort of take stock of where things are going. Uh, certainly, 25 years ago now, uh, some of you are probably familiar with it, Howard Mendel uh, wrote a, a seminal book on the, the dragonflies of Suffolk, which was the first sort of serious stock take of where Suffolk's dragonflies were. Uh, that was a really good book and certainly did Suffolk's reputation in the dragonfly world no harm. Uh, but in the 25 years since that's been written, an awful lot has changed. Uh, I guess, as you've seen a lot of wildlife in general at the moment, in the preceding 200 years, well, things have changed a little, obviously, but suddenly in 25 years, things have changed enormously. Uh, and the time has come to actually sort of think again about Suffolk's dragonflies and, and produce a, a new book. Uh, which you'll have seen advertised on the, uh, the seats you've been sitting on. Uh, I'd just like to, to summarise some of the results, but hopefully not in too much detail in case you feel you don't need to buy the book. But anyway, just to fill you in on, on general tens. Uh, basically, the, the news is good that most of Suffolk's dragonflies, in fact, most of Britain's dragonflies, are actually on the increase, uh, have improved uh, since the, the 1980s. Uh, two principal reasons for this, I guess, are the, the recent improvements in, in water quality and uh, the current uh, uh, trends in the climate as well. A lot of the current trends in dragonflies probably predate the sort of river management work that's undertaken now, but I guess that will feed into it and hopefully continue the positive trends. But anyway, just to illustrate things a little bit more detail. This is the uh, map of uh, species records throughout Suffolk that was obtained in the, uh, the, Atlas, or the new Atlas period <coughs> from about 2008 to 2014. Uh, so you see pretty good coverage of the, of the county really. It gets a bit patchy in the west. Uh, well, Breckland obviously doesn't have a, a great deal of water bodies there. There are fewer recorders there, which doesn't help, but as somebody who lives in the West and has spent a lot of time trudging around looking for ponds, only to, to discover that the, the little clump of trees somewhere and a slight disgusting smell, and that's about it, that a lot of the, the ponds in, in West Suffolk are in, in, in bad shape still. So that's the pond restoration news, it, it is very exciting. But anyway, it's just a general introduction of, of overall records. Uh, some of the more detailed uh, breakdowns, looking at the species, this is the large red-eyed uh, damselfly, uh, Erythroma nias. Uh, the blue dots are the distribution in Howard Mendel's time back in the early 90s. Uh, you see there it was found mainly along the, the Stour, one or two little populations up in Fenland and in the Waveney, but very scattered elsewhere. The red dots are the, the modern survey period. Now, as you see, it is now essentially everywhere, uh, very common uh, species now, whereas uh, very much localised only 25 years ago. Uh, 
is a sister species, the uh, small red-eyed damselfly. It was uh, actually even unknown in, in Britain uh, when Howard uh, wrote his book, but has, has since gone on to colonise Britain. And, and it, it itself is quite uh, widespread in Suffolk. Uh, another one, this is uh, somewhat more of a riverine species than the, the red-eyed damselfly, which tends to occur on... on ponds and lakes as well, but this is the, the scarce chaser, so this is a, an immature male. Uh, the immature coloration is remarkably pretty and I find it very attractive. Uh, if we go back to the distribution maps, in Howard's time it was found essentially in the far north uh, east up in the, the Waveney uh, Valley there, and it had been there for well, as far back as records of Suffolk uh, dragonflies go, and that was its stronghold. In the 90s, it was noticed down on, on the Stour, and now, in uh, modern days, there's actually several uh, river systems that, that hold it, and that, that's clearly uh, spread remarkably. Uh, yeah, 20 years ago, it was, if not a rare species nationally, it was certainly uh, highly localised, uh, found in only sort of seven, I think, major river systems, but now I think this expansion has been pretty universal throughout southern England, and these areas are now starting to merge, and uh, the vernacular name of, of scarce chaser is no longer really a, a, appropriate, uh, but it's nice to see that happening. Uh, again, remarkable difference in, in uh, distribution certainly can't be explained by uh, just increased interest in dragonflies. Uh, this is the, the latest species that a number of you will probably have, have heard about. This is the, the willow emerald uh, damselfly, uh, Britain's most recent, no it's not quite true, the, there's been a recent colonist dragonfly that came in in about 2010. This is the most recent colonist damselfly which arrived in Britain in 2007 where it turned up in, in Trimley uh, on our coast. Uh, interestingly it's actually because its appearance seemed to coincide with the uh, arrival of blue tongue virus in the same area at the same time money was put into finding where the virus came from uh, and it was probably uh, arrived on midges carrying the virus that came over from the Belgium coast in early August 2007 and because the timing and the location were almost exactly the same it's a good chance that the air currents that brought the infected midges over to Britain probably also brought the damselflies over to Britain so this is one of the few instances where the the source of colonization from Britain is actually probably known but anyway that's just a, a uh, an emerald green damselfly uh, has pale uh, wing spots rather than the darker ones of the sister species and it's quite a big one so it's uh, quite easy to tell if you have a good look but if you look at the, the distribution it's been here less than 10 years and is already pretty much throughout the, the county uh, it was the records from Lake and Heath <coughs> last year aren't actually mapped there so there's one record missing uh, at least uh, from there but it's now spread in throughout most of East Anglia it's now into Surrey and there was a record from near down uh, in the Brighton area last year so from its strongholds it's now spreading rapidly throughout Britain uh, as well so there's a, a lot of good news on the uh, dragonfly front which in some ways is nice uh, I said even the common species are by and large doing pretty well. Uh, so that is, is good to hear. The trouble is that there are one or two species that aren't. And it's sometimes difficult to push the case for conservation of the one or two species if the other 95% are doing well. So it's a, it's a two-edged sword, as, as with most things. But anyway, just to remark upon a, a few of the uh, species that are doing less well. Uh, this is the the variable damselfly, closely related to the, the azure damselfly that a lot of people were familiar with. 
This is its distribution in the county. Again, the, the blue dots are the records up till the uh, 1990, and the red dots are the more recent ones. And you see a, a lot of the blue dots uh, populations that have gone extinct uh, in the last, well, most of the decline in this species were actually probably in, in the mid-1900s, that, that area of pollution of, of the waters and drying out of uh, damp areas and the like. So a lot of populations were lost then, but they've not come back through habitat deterioration. Certainly one or two up in the, the northwest were still extant when Howard uh, did his survey, but uh, have gone since then. Uh, fortunately, the decline does seem to have stabilised, though, that uh, certainly up in the, the Waveney Valley, that they're still doing remarkably well. Around Minsmere, they're doing well as well. And harking back to the talk we heard about Lake and Heath, that there's a, a nice strong population up in the, the Lake and Heath area, which is apparently new, though I guess it could conceivably have been in the relic fen there and is now spread into the, the much greater uh, favourable areas as a result of the habitat changes there. So that's one of the species I said that the decline seems to have stabilised, but it's one that <coughs> perhaps we want to keep an eye on for the future. Another species that's doing less well is the... Uh, the emerald damselfly, uh, Lestie's sponsor, is a, a relative of the, of the willow emerald I showed earlier. This is the one that's the traditional British emerald damselfly. And if you look at its distribution map, it's an interesting distribution. It seems, it's, well, being green, it's quite well camouflaged, so you don't always see it every time you go out. Uh, it seems to exist in fairly low population densities in many areas so that populations come and go but you'll see there are a number of new sites the, the red spots without any blue spots there so there's a lot of new sites being discovered in the recent survey but there's an even greater number of old sites being lost and if you look down the, the west uh, of the county apart from the area up in Fenland a lot of those sites seem to have disappeared. Uh, certainly the proportion of records of I received, it used to be something like 4% of all records I received related to this species, and it's now down to only about 1.5%, so as well as the range contracting, the number of records is, is going down. And I think this is a species that tends to breed in shallow waters. It's not, not riverine, it, not lake, uh, not even the deeper ponds. It's the, the smaller waters, the shallow ones, the ones that, that dry up, the ones that get overgrown. So I think a lot of the habitat deterioration is shoveling that away in, into uh, other areas and not necessarily uh, attracting attention. It's, uh, there are species that breed in actually just ephemeral waters. They're, they're geared to breed when it's damp and then emerge and fly away before it dries out. Uh, this common emerald damselfly is less well geared to doing that, so it's caught in between. It, it doesn't favour the deeper waters that are permanent, but uh, can't cope with waters that disappear rapidly either. So I, so I think that's why it's struggling. Uh, so that's one we want to keep on an eye on for the future. Uh, just to end uh, my 10 minutes, just to highlight possible trends for the future that have come out of the, the current survey. If we start up on the, the top left, this is actually Suffolk's rarest uh, dragonfly and damselfly. This is the, the scarce uh, emerald damselfly. So you hear a lot about emerald damselflies. They, they seem to be species of, of the moment at the moment. They've colonised the north of the county coming in from Norfolk and the, the south coming in from Essex apparently. And you see up at Redgrave Fen and at uh, Market Western Fen, they're coming up into this area where the habitat improvement work I is going on. So it, it'll be interesting to follow the, the fate of that species in, in that area. But So that's certainly the, 
They've only appeared in the county in the last 10 years as well, but it, although they are, uh, uh, their strongholds are in Norfolk and Essex. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see whether they actually continue to do as, as well as the other species or whether they're very much on the margin still. So watch this one uh, with bated breath. Right, down on the bottom left, we have, well, we've heard a lot about farm ponds and mar pits and the, the like. Uh, what hasn't got mentioned so far is, is the, the trend for uh, farmland irrigation reservoirs and the like. And this is one, and it's one of uh, Nick's pictures. He can probably tell where it was taken. But uh, certainly, again, in, in the west of the, the county, on the chalk, where water drains away quite rapidly, uh, there's not a lot of standing water. Then the, the farmers are into building these, the big reservoirs to, to maintain the water for irrigation. And these can be quite good for certain species of, of dragonfly, but they don't have quite the same breadth as the traditional farm pond. So it'll be interesting to follow developments there. Are there ways of maximizing diversity on these habitats? And what are their influence on, on, on the wider countryside? Right, up on the top right-hand corner, this is a picture up on the, the upper stour. Uh, typical sort of uh, wheat monoculture in the foreground and rape in the background. No water there at all whatsoever. The, the stour river does run through in the middle of the picture, but it, it's totally overgrown. So I think this banded demoiselle occurs in uh, that tetrad, but no other species of dragonfly is only just moving through. So they're, they're, even on the sort of general positive trends the species are showing, there's still room for habitat improvements. And then bottom right, uh, this is the, the small emerald damselfly, Lestes virens, again a, a non-British species at the moment, but it's one that comes up right up to the channel uh, coast and is expanding in its range and increasing its numbers in Belgium and Holland so it's one of the candidates to be the next species to appear in Britain uh, because it looks so similar to what used to be one but are already three others that are here then it might be a year or two before it's spotted but we'll have to wait and see that uh, this whole area of, of dragonflies in the south of England is uh, quite an exciting time at the moment and as I said fortunately the general trends are, are positive but that's only the general trends there's still room for improvement uh, if you want to uh, find out more then purchase the book the uh, text and pictures are all ready so the layout needs to be sorted and it'll be printed so maybe another two months before it's out but it, it's very imminent and if you want to sign up now then you get a free copy of of Howard's book thrown in if you haven't got one already. So, okay, thanks very much.